Hello tax students, this is Roy. Well, we're going to cover here in chapter 3, in part 1, some basic or overall concepts regarding gross income. And then in part 2, we'll take a look at more detail of specific types of income. So let's talk about some terminology here. Maybe I'll give you an example. So let's say that you have a home. As you can see, I'm not uh, an artist, I'm an accountant. And you're going to buy this house either for your personal residence or uh, an investment. So you buy it at a certain cost, or we'll see this is called adjusted basis. And hopefully it increases in value, the so-called fair market value whatever a willing buyer and willing seller with uh, adequate knowledge about the property are willing to exchange at a certain amount okay, the fair market value and hopefully this amount increases over time and if you take the difference between that value and cost this is a gain hopefully not a loss right where the cost would be bigger than the value and you're still owning this home over the years, hopefully again increasing in value. The cost wouldn't change unless you make some type of improvement to the property. So if the value goes up, the gain will go up. But you, And this is an economic benefit, but you don't pay any tax on it right away as it increases the value as you own the property. Only when you sell it, you give up that property does this gain become realized? Now, when you own the property and it's increasing in value and this potential gain goes up, we call this gain unrealized. Okay, so not, let's say, um, a, a, an event that creates you to pay taxes on it. So only when you sell it is this gain realized. So let's say, again, this is a, an investment property. You bought it to make a profit and you don't live here. Yeah, Maybe you had rented it out over the years. Well, then that realized gain on the sale has to be recognized or reported on your tax return and you can pay taxes on it. Okay, so realize is triggered by the sale unrealizes the appreciation or maybe depreciation when you own it yeah but you don't have to report it so here's the sale and now you got to report it reportable or recognized let's change the facts here so let's say the house is your personal residence and you've been living here for a few years that is increased in value you have an unrealized gain then you sell it at a gain and if the gain is 250000 if you're single or married to uh, half a million, you still have now a realized gain upon the sale. But that gain is not going to be taxed or it's going to be unrecognized. You don't have to pay taxes on it. Okay. So again, the, the, gain, the, the gain is triggered by the sale, be it... Um, recognize or not and depending upon the facts it's going to be recognized if you held it for investment or well, it's not going to be recognized if this is your personal residence and the amount is under 250,000 or half a million depending upon your filing status or, or ownership in the property okay so that's the two R words here realize and recognize you can think of recognize as reportable taxable income And the tax laws are made for both purposes of the government, here they call it administrative convenience, and for the taxpayer, the wherewithal to pay. In the case of administrative convenience, the government wants to make sure that the tax laws are enforceable. So typically, like we saw in the case of sales, it's going to get the gain tax at the point of sale and not before that. Yeah not when there's an unrealized gain. Or 
for administrative convenience, they leave it up to the employer to report employees' wages, employees' taxable compensation. The government leaves it up to financial institutions to make sure that all the tax reporting paperwork is done in terms of reporting interest and dividends and sale of investments. Okay, so that's for the convenience of the government. And yet the government. The wherewithal to pay tries to make sure the taxpayer has sufficient funds to pay taxes. And typically, if you have to report income without any cash being received, you don't have the wherewithal to pay. So most times, the tax is going to be triggered by an event where the taxpayer will have eventually the funds to pay their taxes. Now, keep in mind that most of us earn our big income through our salary or wage, and the employer is going to withhold income taxes throughout the whole year. So that means we have the wherewithal to pay the tax, and we have to file our tax return. We've seen this section of the Internal Revenue Code mentioned in uh, back, back in Chapter 1, where it says that everything is taxable income unless it's specifically excluded, yeah, tax-free. This is Section 61 of the Internal Revenue Code called Gross Income. We'll see uh, in Part 2 um, various types of gross income and the calculation of how much is taxable. Now keep in mind, most times we're talking about money, dollars, yeah? But your income can also include goods, products, merchandise, or services that you receive, both um, valued at the so-called fair market value that we had talked about previously. So, for example, if you receive a cash bonus from your employer for doing a good job, well, definitely that's taxable income, gross income. But how about if your employer gives you a car? Maybe even the use of a car, like a rental car, for being such a good employee. Well, again, that is goods or merchandise, and it is taxable. We may see situations where some type of compensation is non-taxable, um, but generally the uh, rule is includable unless specifically excluded. Or maybe your employer provides you a free service because you're such a good employee, like free laundry service or free um, uh, hair service. Well, that's a taxable benefit yeah whatever value you get now there may be ex some exceptions where it's for the convenience not of the employee to provide this service or goods but it's for the benefit of the employer like the employer doesn't want you to leave the building because they want you to keep on working or maybe then poss possibly providing something like food maybe some minimal services to keep you on the job, to keep you in the office, is non-taxable because it benefits the employer, not the employee. We've seen this list of different types of income, specifically when we saw, again, Internal Revenue Code Section 61. Yeah, they specifically mentioned this. And it kind of matches up with the tax form, the 1040 form here in this income section. If you kind of zoom in on this section, we'll see the same pretty much titles that we saw in that Internal Revenue Code section. So we're supposed to be filling in this blanks here in this right-hand column with the dollar amount, so we eventually have to subtotal and then subtract out deductions eventually to get to the taxable income. So we'll focus on some of these amounts here in part two of our video for this chapter three. One of the things that is a no-no in the eyes of the government is to have your income taxed to someone else in a lower tax bracket. They call that assignment of income. And the textbook cites a couple different court cases saying that's not allowed. Whoever provides the service that gets paid for that service, that person providing the service has to report the income. 
like when you work for your employer you cannot tell your employer to pay your your brother your your son your your daughter and have them pay taxes on that income you provided the service you have to report that compensation for those services on your tax return or if you own property that generates income either like interest or dividends on investments or rental property as a landlord you're collecting rent if you own this property you cannot assign this income to be taxed to other people you got to report this as income it is possible to shift income to other people but in the case of compensation for services you have to hire that other person and pay them a fair wage or salary and now that is income to that other person so in the case of small businesses where the owner has family sometimes they hire their kids and you cannot overpay them but now you can shift income by um, having those kids report income as their for their pay for the services they provide and the owner our taxpayer gets to deduct those payments yeah as a business expense or in the case of property if you sell the property or gift the property to someone else now they own that other person owns a property now that investment income that rent can be reported by those other people now if for some reason you try to shift the property back to the original owner the original taxpayer that's pretty much a sham and then you wouldn't be able to convert that income to someone else transfer the income to someone else when again or again the term is called assignment of income you can't do that the reason why shifting income sometimes is beneficial and sometimes those are the planning techniques mentioned at the ends of our chapters is because of the graduated tax rate in this case we're looking at a tax rate schedule for a single filing status so the first nine thousand or so of taxable income is taxed at the lowest rate of ten percent but once you earn more than this the next amount over this bracket is going to be taxed at 15 percent all the way up to 37,650 and after that it moves up into the next bracket all the way up to the highest bracket of of uh, almost 40 percent so if you're in this high tax bracket and you want to lower your taxes you try to shift income like to your kids way down here who only pays 10 percent so the saving is almost like 30% by just keeping the money in the family but shifting income down to someone in a lower tax bracket. Here we talk about maybe moving income among spouses. Most times it's always beneficial to file married filing joint if you have a married couple but if you want to file for whatever reason married filing separate here's one spouse's return and married filing separate here's another spouse's return or well, again they can file just one joint return married filing joint so all of the income and all of the deductions are reported on one tax return but here it says depending upon whether the taxpayers are residents of a common law state or community property state will determine how much income each spouse has to report Hawaii is a common law we're one of these 41 states here most of the community property states are in the west or southwest the big ones being California and Texas in common law let's say here in Hawaii you, again almost always it's beneficial to file a joint return but if for whatever reason you're gonna file separate returns one spouse will re report his or her income and the other spouse will report his or her income you don't divide up the incomes equally chop this in half report half half that will generally be true in the case of a community property state you look at income earned by the whole couple then pretty much what earned during the year you split it 50 50. ok 
Okay, so that's community property. Hawaii was a community property state many, many years ago, before I even got into taxes. But we follow common law now. And it doesn't um, shift you into a lower tax bracket if you're uh, separate versus joint. Let me go back to the tax table. Let's you see this uh, married filing joint, and here are the brackets. Pretty much double the uh, single brackets. So let's say that you had eighteen thousand five hundred fifty dollars of taxable income around there. Well, you would fall in this ten percent. Well, let's say this amount here, seventy-five thousand. You would fall in the fifteen percent bracket in this range here. And if you cut it in half, let's say what thirty-seven, uh, thirty-eight thousand, you don't jump down into a, a lower bracket here. For married filing separate, the brackets are pretty much cut in half, like nine thousand taxed at ten percent. The next um, uh, thirty. 36, 37, 38,000 tax at 15. It's almost like th these brackets here for married filing, married filing separate versus joint. So no benefit just by itself trying to split the same income equally among the two separate returns versus one joint return. We talked about the kitty tax back in chapter one to catch people trying to assign income or avoid income by shifting income to their kids the tax on the kids are charged at a high rate the kids who are dependent minor children under uh, 19 or students under 24 being claimed as a dependents by our taxpayers the kids now the first $1,050 is tax-free because it's going to equal their standard deduction Remember, we learned about standard deduction calculations back in Chapter 2. Then the next $10,050 of income is going to be taxed at the kids' rates. And we saw the lowest rates um, were that 10%, so maybe a $105 uh, tax on this income, zero tax on this income. But anything over that, is going to be taxed at the parents' rates. The higher rates could be close to 40%. Okay, that's the, the so-called kiddie tax. Now, once this kid is not a dependent anymore, probably an adult child, now the regular rates will kick in. You get a regular standard deduction. Yeah? you get the regular rates again let me go back again here this regular rates here again that kitty tax zero for the first thousand fifty ten percent for the next thousand fifty and then whatever high rate the parents in for anything over that two thousand one hundred amount once the child becomes not a depend anymore you fall back into the regular rates here no more kitty tax So that was kitty tax. Okay, so let's talk about accounting method. What you guys learned in prior accounting classes is a called called the accrual basis method of accounting. But for you as an individual and for most small businesses, we use the cash method or sometimes called cash receipts and disbursements method where generally we record income, we report income when it is received and not necessarily at the time it was earned. For example, I'm a state employee and I get paid twice a month, but they kind of lag the time I get paid. If I work, let's say, the ending days of the month, I really don't get paid by the end of the month. I get paid on the fifth of the next month for that time I had worked the previous month. You know? So I would report when I receive that income later, not at the time I earn it. Now what you earn most times is going to be cash, but if what you get 
is property, like we saw before, or services, then you got to report these two things at its so-called fair market value at the time you collect that property or that service. Sometimes you hear the term, uh, maybe you don't hear it, but you see situations called barter, where you have one taxpayer dealing with another taxpayer, and they don't spend money between each other. They don't buy or sell using cash. What they do is exchange property or they exchange services. The example in our textbook, I believe, is one taxpayer who is a painter does painting work for an attorney, and that attorney does work, legal work for the painter. And again, no, no cash, just trading services, trading property. Well, that doesn't make it non-taxable because you don't have cash. You have value in the services being exchanged. And whatever value you get at the time you get it is what you got to report as income because you work to get that income. Yeah? Now, this person has the same situation. It's when they get the services, they have to report it. Yeah? Not at the time they earn and provide the service to the other person. Just because you don't directly have the money in your hand doesn't mean cash basis taxpayers don't report income. But if you have the right to use the money here made available to you, you still got to report it as income. Now, if there is some limitation in its use, then maybe you don't have to report it. So typical example, they don't uh, give you money until the very end of the year. But still, it was that year. There's a cutoff, and if it was available by December 31st, you got to report it. Now, if they give you a check that is, let's say, post-dated, and you cannot cash it, right? That's a limitation, so you don't have to report it. Or the person doesn't have any money in the account to make the check good. That's another limitation. You don't have to report that bad check. What's a rule without exceptions? This is exceptions maybe to the, um, uh, well, they're specific to these situations here. So here is savings bonds. If you're familiar with savings bonds, you would buy them and not report any interest income on the bonds until you redeem or cash the bonds. But you can elect and it will be shown as a planning example at the end of this chapter where you can go uh, accrue basis, accrue basis method of accounting versus cash basis. Cash would be when you cash the bonds in and report the bond interest income. Accrue basis would be, again, this is savings bonds now, is reporting the interest that has been earned, increasing in value during the year. Okay, Farm and ranching has specific... Uh, uh, accounting rules regarding when you report income. You can defer, you can postpone the reporting of income if you're a farmer collecting on crop insurance. Instead of the year you receive that insurance, if you can report that as income in the following year. In the case of ranching, I've done a ranch many, many years ago. Uh, if there's some type of uh, disaster, like a drought, you can defer the reporting of any sales during that year, during that drought period, reported as income in the next year. If it had accelerated, if that disaster accelerated you selling that um, that that cattle, that that livestock. Um, we'll talk about this exception regarding accrual basis for inventories uh, when we cover this the next section for invent for for accrual basis. So here is accrual basis. Again, this is the method that you guys were learning in the prior accounting classes. The first day of those class, yeah, you guys learned to report income when it was earned and not when you collected the money later on. So to be accrual basis method, you got to have the right to receive the money, even though you haven't collected it yet. And the amount has to be um, determinable accurate right you know the amount you're gonna get 
You did the work. You sold the merchandise, and you know the amount you're going to collect. Well, you got to report it as income. What's a rule again without exceptions? They say if you got the money in advance, the prepaid income. You guys remember that unearned fees liability in that first accounting class? That and you waited until you did the work to report that uh, fee income? Well, the tax rules say if you get paid ahead of time, you don't wait till you do the work. You got to report it as income. If you require a down payment, if you um, get an advance, if you get a retainer, and you're going to do the work later on, the general rule is you report it when you collect the money and not when you do the work. But you know what? This says there's exceptions to the exceptions. If you're going to report uh, income for tax purposes the same way you do it on your financial statement, then they say you can probably defer it maybe up to a year. Or here, and, and this, is for, um, this is for selling stuff, merchandise, yeah? There's another rule for selling services where you get money in advance. Whatever work you do during the current year, you, you got to report it for that year. And anything else you re receive in advance beyond the current year, you have to report it in the second year, yeah, the following year, even though the work can continue into a, possibly a third year. Yeah, So you report the income you collect for the current year for the current year's work. You report income in the second year for money that you reported and you collected in the first year. If you still have anything undone, un, if you still have work for future years, you have to report the income you collected ahead of time in the second year here. Let me kind of um, illustrate this over a timeline. Let's, let's get a white screen here. So here's our timeline. And here's the point of sale. Here's when you sell the merchandise, when you do the work. So we, and let's do this with debits and credits. We don't talk too much about journalizing here in our tax class, but you guys did this in past tax classes. So when you make the sale, you're gonna credit the revenue account, probably sales, yeah? And what are you gonna debit? Well, if you collect the money right away at the point of sale, like an over-the-counter sale, or you give the, the invoice to the customer, and you cut your check right away, or you, credit, you um, use a, a credit card, uh, a sale, right? You got the money in your, in your account. Debit the cash and credit revenue. Here is revenue. Here's income you got to report. But let's say you make the sale, credit revenue, but you don't collect the cash right away. You're going to collect it in the, in the future here. So what are you going to debit? You guys remember, right? Accounts receivable. And then later on, you collect the cash, debit, and you reduce the receivable credit. Cash basis says you report over here in the future when you collect the money. Or um, accrual basis says you report the income over here when you made the sale. Now, if this was not selling a product but services, you do the work here, you don't have to go accrual basis. The rule, there's an exception, yeah? Let's see where the ex what was the exception. Well, I I'm not going to lose this screen here. Let's um. I'll summarize in the next screen. But let's say that you get the money in advance of doing the work, selling. So that was in the past. You debited cash. You got the money ahead of doing the work. What did you credit? At the same time, you collected the money. Possibly some type of liability. Again, that unearned fees account, that deposit payable that you owe to your customer. And then when you do do the work, you credit revenue and you reduce the liability. 
See, revenue reported when the work is done. But if your cash basis, you look at cash, you look at cash. You see this here? Even a crew basis may have to do this, right? You got the money in advance of doing the work. Unless you fall into one of the, that, this exceptions over here, yeah? Let me um, mention one more exception. If you sell merchandise, you sell a product, you got to go accrue method. If your sales, uh, accrue method for sale of merchandise, the other parts of your business, you can go cash basis. But the sales part, selling and buying merchandise, usually you got to go accrue basis. Now, if you're a small business with sales under a million, you can go cash basis. That's also considering the cost of goods calculation would go cash basis, not a crew basis. That's a sale under a million averaging for annually for the past three years. Also, if you're a relatively large business where the sales uh, is not the main, sale of merchandise is not the main um, service you provide, not the main income you get, and it's under 10 million, you generally can go cash basis. Okay, so these rules are detailed more so in um, our textbook. Let me stop here and then go ahead and continue looking at chapter 3, part 2 in the next video.